Our scripture reading this morning, uh, there are two of them. The first scripture reading is from the Psalms. It is Psalm 139, verses 7 through 12. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in shale, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and settle at the farthest limits of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, and the light around me become night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as the day, for darkness is as light to you. Our second scripture reading is from the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verses 18 through 24. John 14, 18 through 24. And you can find that if you want to follow along. This is our text for the day. You can find that on page 109 in the New Testament section of the Pew Bibles. I will not leave you orphaned. I am coming to you. In a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. They who have my commandments and keep them are those who love me. And those who love me will be loved by my Father, and I will love them and reveal myself to them. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will reveal yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered him, Those who love me will keep my word, and my Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words, and the word that you hear is not mine, but is from the Father who sent me. The word of the Lord for the people of the Lord. I have the pleasure this morning of introducing our guest preacher. He is not new to us. Keith Giles has preached several times before at our congregation. Uh, he is a dear friend of my family and is becoming quickly a dear friend of our church uh, after many years. Uh, he um, is a best selling author of several books uh, that many of you I know have read. Uh, he is also um, a great theologian, and so we are happy to have him here in El Paso, and we are very happy to have him back at First Presbyterian Church. Please welcome Keith Giles. Thank you. Grab those two. Wow, thank you guys so much. Uh, I am very blessed to be with you again today, and um, I'm always surprised you keep asking me back, so hopefully this is a trend <laughs> that continues. Um, yes, I, I, I've known Neil for quite a while, and I'm very blessed to have gotten to know many of you here um, and to share with you this morning. So the topic that I want to speak about this morning is actually, believe it or not, one of the most controversial, the most scandalous topics, bar none, I have ever spoken. Every single time I speak on this topic, or I write a blog post about this topic, or I write about this in one of my books, um, I get criticized and attacked, and you would think this was the most shocking thing in the world that I could possibly talk about. And, and the topic is this, the love of God. Now, it seems really bizarre, doesn't it? It's shocking to me, too. But I even hear from Christians. I mean, other Christians will criticize me and say, Keith, you talk about the love of God too much. And I just... I don't understand this because, you know, it does actually say that God is love. So if I'm supposed to be a preacher of the gospel, I'm supposed to be a teacher and preacher of the good news of Jesus Christ, how am I supposed to do that without talking about love, if God is love? And so prepare yourselves. This, this might get a little crazy, uh, hopefully not too much. I don't think it's that scandalous, but for some people, it's a shocking topic to talk about the love of God. One of my favorite passages uh, about this topic of the love of God is in Ephesians chapter 3 and starting uh, in verse 17, where uh, actually in verse 16, where Paul says to the Ephesians, he says, I pray that out of his glorious riches, 
that God may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray, he says, that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all of the saints to grasp, just to grasp, to grasp how high and wide and long and deep is the love of God for you in Christ Jesus. And then he adds this other part. He says, because this love of God transcends knowledge. It goes beyond our understanding. And in a way, another way of saying that would be if you could somehow have all of the knowledge in the universe, Paul says, it wouldn't be enough for you to fully comprehend and understand how great the love of God is for you in Christ Jesus. And I love that. And so as we're talking about this topic of God and the love of God, the other thing I think it's very important for us to understand is to recognize is that love doesn't begin with us. That love actually comes, it originates from God. And we have a couple of places in the scriptures where it says this. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 7, it says, Let us love one another, for love comes from God. And it also says a few verses later in 1 John 4, 10, this is love, not that we love God, but that God loved us. And so here's the, keep that in mind because when we come to this idea of loving God and loving others, right? Jesus was asked, what is the greatest of all the commandments? And he says, well, the first greatest command is what? To love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then he said, then the second greatest commandment is like the first one, and it's to love your neighbor as yourself. So these two ideas are connected, loving God and loving your neighbors. These two things are connected. Okay, we can't separate these ideas. But again, understand, for me to obey that, for me to put that into practice, what Jesus is saying, to love God and love my neighbors, I first have to recognize that where does this love come from? It doesn't come from me originally, it comes from God. So that means I have to practice receiving the love of God. Does that make sense? I have to be able to receive God's love so that as I'm filled with the love of God, now I have love to share with you, right? But here's this interesting principle. It took me a while to notice this. But for us to complete that cycle, for us to really truly be obedient to what Jesus is asking us to do, to love God and love others, we have to receive love from God and then we also have to learn how to receive love from others. So, you know, you can try as hard as you want to love me, but as long as I'm holding you back like this, you're not really going to be able to love me, right? Because I'm not receiving it. The same is true of God. God can be pouring out night and day his love upon you in all these different ways, but if you're deaf to it, if you're blind to it, or if you are actively saying, no, 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 God, then you're not really receiving that love. And so that cycle is broken. So we have to get really good at practicing receiving love from God and from others. But let's be honest, I'll just be honest with you, myself, I don't want to ask you to raise your hand or anything, but I'll be honest, I struggle with this. It's really hard, if I'm honest, to receive love from other people. You know, even just to receive a compliment, you know? Oh, Keith, that was a good message, or oh, Keith, I really like that, what you said, or I really like what you did, or man, you look really good today. What's my first knee-jerk reaction? Oh, no, no, no. Oh, no, no, it's not me, right? Oh, no, don't, no, no. Well, what am I doing? I'm deflecting any affection. I'm deflecting any kind of love in any form, right? And why do we do this? And I think one of the reasons why we do this is that deep, deep down inside, we doubt whether or not we deserve that kind of love, right? We say, oh, yeah, but yeah, I know what you're for being nice. That's nice, but you don't really know me. If you knew me, you wouldn't say that. You know, well, okay, yeah, sure, whatever. But, but that's why we hold one another at bay, and I think sometimes we hold God and his love at arm's length, because again, deep down, we feel as if we don't deserve this love of God. Well, if you ever felt that way, um, I think I have some good news for you. You know, last time I was here, it was almost exactly a year ago today. Um, I'm sure you'd never forget my message, <clears throat> but I'll just remind you. What I preached about was um, the Lord's Prayer. And what I talked about was how the Lord's Prayer, our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, right? You know the prayer. What I pointed out last time I was here 
was that that prayer that Jesus teaches his disciples to pray, that we repeat even now, right? After the service, you're going to stand up and repeat it again. But what, I think what I want us to notice is that what Jesus does when he, he teaches us to pray this way, it's not, I don't pray my Father who is in heaven, forgive me my sins, give me my daily bread. That's not how Jesus teaches us to pray. He says, when you pray, pray this way, our Father. Forgive us our sins. Give us today our daily bread. And so it's a reminder of our connection to God and our connection to one another. Again, going back to what are the most important things? Loving God and loving our neighbors ourselves. And so I just want to remind you, we've already kind of talked about this once before, and I just want to build on that idea. Jesus teaches us this prayer that reminds us that we are all connected to God and to one another. It's a prayer of community that's meant to remind us of this important fact. That we are all one family with one Father. And so the verses that we read today, the verse in John chapter 14, verse 20, um, Jesus says this really amazing thing. And I think sometimes we can jump over it, so I want to just focus on it just a little bit. Jesus says, in that day you will know that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me, and I am in you. And if you really meditate on that, it'll break your brain a little bit. I'm, I'm serious. I used to try to, I'm not joking, I used to try to think of it like almost like those Russian nesting dolls, you know? You got this really big doll, but you take the top off, oh, it's an elephant inside. And you take that one, oh, there's a smaller one inside. And you just kind of go down, down, down. It just keeps going and going and going, right? So I'm like, okay, I'm going to try to understand what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying, I am in the Father. Okay, so Jesus is in the Father, but the Father is in him. And he is in me. What? That is kind of astounding, right? That'll kind of like make you stop and think, what's going on here? It's not three-dimensional, right? It's something that is paradoxical. It kind of breaks your brain. You have to think, okay, I need to meditate on this a little bit. What does this mean? And so another way to express that same idea, the Apostle Paul says it this way in Colossians chapter 2, starting in verse 9. Paul says this. He says, for in Christ, the whole fullness of God dwells in bodily form. And then he says, you have been filled with Christ. It's the same idea. In Christ, the fullness of the Godhead dwells in bodily form, and you are filled with Christ. So in you is Christ, and in Christ is the fullness of God. Again, how is this possible? Um, Paul also says in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 22 through 23, he says, you, speaking to us, you are filled with the fullness of Christ, who fills everything in every way. Now, that one really gets me. How is this possible? I am filled with the fullness of Christ. Christ fills everything in every way. What are the possible ways that would come under the umbrella of every way? I don't know, but if you can think of one, that way. Every way. Again, this is also what Paul says in Colossians 3.11, that Christ is all, and he is in all. And so, again, our other verse today was in Psalms 39, 139, where David asked this question, where can I go from the presence of God? If I ascend to the heavens, you're there. If I descend even to the grave, there you are. In fact, no matter where I may go, guess what? God is there. There is nowhere to go where God is not. And so <laughs> there is nothing anywhere that is not filled with the fullness of, of, of Christ because Christ fills everything in every way. This is, by the way, why Paul, when he is speaking in the book of Acts to the uh, Athenians, he's in Athens, and these are pagan idol worshipers. I mean, this is pretty low stuff, okay? This is pretty, in, in some ways, to be honest, a little disgusting, the way the pagans worship their idols. I won't go into it, but it was not good. And so here he is in front of these, you know, He's addressing these pagan idol worshipers, uh, worshipers in Athens. And here's what he says to them. He goes, I want you to know something. This unknown God that you have an idol to, I know that unknown God. And this God is your father, and you are his children. And in fact, 
This is the God in whom we all live and move and have our being. Whoa. That's a radical idea. That there's nowhere to go that's separate from God. It's sort of like two fish, you know, swimming in the ocean, and one fish says to the other fish, well, the water's kind of cold today. And the other fish says, what's water? Because you don't think of it. It's just around you. You're surrounded by it, right? There's nowhere to go to get away from it. And so this is why the Apostle Paul can ask this question in Romans chapter 8, verse 35. He asked this question, can anything separate us from the love of God? And then he answers his own question a couple of verses later in verse 38. His answer is this, no. I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love, neither death nor life, not angels or demons, not the future and not the past. No power, no height, no depth, nor anything else in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. I feel like I want to have a Pentecostal moment right now. It's like, woo! Yes, glory, amen. That is amazing that nothing will ever separate you and I from the love of God. Nothing, nothing. Now, as great as that might be, and I, I, I get really excited to be honest when I meditate on these things and think about these things. If we are just really, again, let's just get honest. Let's be real with ourselves. Do you ever sometimes feel that God is far away? Do you ever feel like you're praying and they're just your prayers are bouncing off the ceiling? You might even say, God, where are you? I don't know. I don't know where you are. Are you here? Are you even listening to me? Or you might even just feel alone in general. You just feel lonely. There's just not people around you. You don't feel like there's anyone in your life that really seems to care. And those feelings are real. I'm not trying to say, oh, don't, don't, don't believe that. Don't, you know, ignore those feelings. No, that's a real feeling. Your feelings are, are real. They're, they're saying something real about where you're at in that moment. My hope, my encouragement to you is when you find yourself in those moments to remember the truth, the reality, that no matter what you feel, the truth is this. Nothing can ever separate you from the love of God. Nothing. Not the future, not the past, right? No height, no depth, no angel, nor demon. Nothing will ever in all creation be able to separate you from the love of God. That's the reality, and that's the truth. And so, if we are one with God through Christ in this way, if it's true what Jesus says, in that day you will know, I am in the Father, the Father is in me, and, and I am in you. And we have this connection. Then, you know what it also means? Not only do you have this amazing connection with God through Christ, you know, you're not alone in that, right? The rest of us aren't standing up here watching you going, wow, look at them. Wow, they're really up there with Jesus and God, and they're really, look at that oneness they have. Isn't that cool? No, no, I'm there too. We're all up there. We're all connected with, with God through Christ. We all experience this amazing union and oneness. And you know, so you know what that means? That unity I have with God through Christ, it's so amazing. I also have it with all of you because we're all connected. That's this beautiful community. And Jesus, that's why Jesus can pray in John 17, 21. He says, I pray that they, that's us, I pray that they would be one even as the Father and I are one. And again, think about that. In what ways are Jesus and the Father one? It's like we can't tell where one begins and the other ends, right? It's this whole idea of the Trinity where the Father isn't the Son and the Son isn't the Father and the Spirit isn't the Father or the Son and three of them are these distinct persons and yet somehow all three of them are in such incredible unity they are the one God. And Jesus says, my prayer is that you guys would be one like that. That's an amazing connection and oneness, isn't it? It's not just, ah, he's, he's a good guy. Ah, I can tolerate him, you know, for 10 minutes. No, it's, it's the realization that we are connected, that we are one in Christ Jesus, that we would experience the same amazing oneness. And the title of my message this morning was The Quantum Theory of Love. And I don't have any, the time it would take to really go into depth in this. Um, I'm just going to try and very briefly summarize for you. I've been studying, I've been reading some books on quantum science, quantum physics. Now this is, a, in the last 20 years, scientists, we're talking scientists, okay? 
This is not quacks, not weirdos, it's not new age. This is science, okay? Um, scientists, most of them, by the way, atheists, um, are studying quantum and quarks and electrons and, and looking down, you know, at this, uh, this level. And what they're recognizing is that it kind of is an illusion that there are separate things in the universe. Like, there's this stand and, and there's a guitar over there and then, you know, there's a pew over here. And, you know, these look like separate things. But at this, you know, microscopic subatomic level, what they're, what they're discovering is that all these things are connected. They're interconnected in ways that kind of blow their minds. And in fact, I hear some of these guys sometimes talking. I watch some, some lectures that they've given. Again, scientists, they, these are, again, many of them not even believers in, in, in anything, in faith at all. And as they'll be giving a lecture, about halfway through the lecture, as they're explaining how quantum science is revealing that all these things are connected, they'll stop themselves and say, now, I know I sound like a theologian right now. Oh, no, I know I sound like a philosopher right now. You know why? Because it makes them a little nervous that they recognize I, I'm talking about the science, but the science is affirming things that a theologian would say. That, wow, we're kind of all connected. One of the most amazing things about quantum science is this. And again, I read this in a, in a book I was reading on quantum science, where the author of this book, who is a scientist and who studies quantum theory, he said, you know, for the longest time, science has assumed that, you know, the, the universe is really just made up of matter and energy, right? Physical objects. And, and we are physical objects. We're just matter. And, um, and that's the way we've understood, using science, how we understand the universe and how things work. But there's been a question that science has not been able to answer. And philosophers have also wrestled with this, and it's kind of been this tug of war, this debate between philosophers and theologians and scientists. And, here, and the question is this. How can science explain, if it's true that we're all just matter and energy, then can, how can science explain how consciousness, human consciousness, how, why does it arise in the human brain and not over a banana or a giraffe or a pineapple, right? You have to explain. Why, how is it? Why is it that consciousness has arisen in human beings? And science has been very unable to answer this question. Now, this is, what I, this is the sentence that I read in the quantum science book that I was just reading a few months ago. The scientist in this book said this. He said, that question, how does consciousness arise from matter? Quantum science is revealing to us this. That's the wrong question. The real question we should be asking is this. How does matter arise from consciousness? In other words, the beginning is consciousness. Consciousness is what connects everything, and matter comes later. And when I read that sentence, the first thing that popped into my head was, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Isn't that amazing? It's just astounding to me to see how these things are converging, these ideas are converging. But it is true that there is no separation between us and one another, and between God and us. And so the beautiful thing is this, it means that you and I will never know from here to eternity. You and I will never know what it's like. We will never know anything other than what it's like to be moving nearer and nearer and nearer to the presence and the love of God. Why? Well, because nothing will ever separate you, not death, not life, not the future, not the past. And he says, I'll never leave you and I'll never forsake you. So our only possible experience from here to eternity is to have more and more and more of a revelation and a realization of our connection with God through Christ. That is great news. And so this, this is why when you think about this, when you meditate on these kinds of things that, that I'm talking about, you know, this is why we can say that Christ in you is the hope of glory. This is why we can say in 1 John 4, 16 that God is love and all who live in love live in God and God lives in them. It's why Jesus can say in Matthew 25, hey, whatever you do to the least of these, you did it to me. Why? Well, because we're connected. There is no separation there. It's why Saul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus when Jesus appears to him in a vision and he says you know, to Saul who's been persecuting the church, Saul, why do you persecute me? And Saul's like, what are you talking about? I'm just, I'm persecuting these Christians. And Jesus says, well, when you hurt them, it hurts me. There's this connection. Again, there is not a separation. There is this connection. 
And it's why Paul can say that now there is no Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female, rich or poor, and if I may, gay or straight, Democrat or Republican, black or white, fill in the blank. Those separations are illusions there. We make those categories up and we divide ourselves from one another, but that is not reality. The reality is we are one, as Paul says in that passage. There is no more any of these things, he says. He says, but we are all one in Christ Jesus. And so our realization of and trust in Jesus is our amen to God's eternal presence within us. And I would encourage you, if you have a chance today, to get alone somewhere, to just ask God, God, are you in me? Has the Father come to make his home in me? Do you love me as I am? Not as I should be, because none of us are gonna be as we should be, but as I am right now, God, you love me with this everlasting love. And that kind of thing can set us free to love everyone else, to receive love from others, to receive love from God without fear. And so all we need to do is to be still and to know the presence of God, that God is near, that we are one with God and begin to practice receiving this love, this love of God that is higher and wider and lo longer and deeper than we can possibly imagine. And my prayer for you and for myself is that we would have power from God and his Holy Spirit to know this love that transcends knowledge and that we would be filled with the fullness of Christ who fills everything in every way.